Lead the Fest 2022. Lead better, rise stronger. 17. Lead the Talk. 8 Offline Road Shows. 1945 Real Leader Stories. Lead the Future Scholarship. Teras Belajar Spesial. Lead the Stage. Pemimpin Indonesia Award. Memimpin lebih baik, bangkit lebih kuat. Lead the Fest 2022. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Aditya, and I'm a lecturer of SBM IT and also the director of product uh, development in the education. So uh, I will be the moderator uh, for these uh, sessions. And then for today's sessions, yeah, uh, the session we will discuss about um, well-being and securities and also value a guide for you to leader. As we know, this topic is really a hot issue between uh, the young generation and the young leaders out there, especially for the high school students and also for the college students and, of course, the first graduate that will be uh, moved into the next step of their life, which is uh, working in the organization. So in this special period, leaders also have to solve this issue, but uh, a lot of uh, these leaders didn't know how we have to solve uh, the problem of insecurities, well-being, and also the value that will lead us into uh, a better person, into a better leader. So that is why we have a very great speakers today uh, that will give you a lot of insight about how this issue uh, can be solved uh, between all of these people. Okay, and without further ado, I will invite the first speaker. Uh, for today's session, uh, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Saiba Roy. Dr. Saiba Roy is the co-founder and managing director of XCI Region. Good afternoon, Dr. Hello. Hello. Okay, how are you doing? hello. Well, I'm fine. It's very good to see you today. And how are you? How are you today? Uh, good. Very. Uh... Very pleased to be with you, and uh, I have a few remarks prepared. I'm looking forward very much to sharing them. Would you like me uh, to to go ahead and start? Yeah, uh, sure. Well, okay. sure. Uh, well, again, thank you uh, for the opportunity to share uh, these remarks uh, today. I feel most honoured and humbled to receive to have received your kind invitation. So, I'm sure of our Roy. I am a founding member of the Values 20 or V20, an engagement group of the G20 aligned with the G20 presidency of Indonesia. Of course, uh, I'm also, as introduced, uh, a co-founder of a, a wonderful small organization I will speak more about a little later. Um, I would love to tell you uh, all about the V20 so hopefully in the minutes ahead, I will earn your interest and an opportunity to follow up. I'd like to focus my remarks on the topic of how leadership and personal values correlates with well-being, specifically in the early stages of professional life. I'll share a couple of examples and leave you with a question and a plea. Uh, I do have of slides uh only two uh, i will need them a little later i'm uh hoping okay. the support team will be able to put them up at the right time but it's not not quite now but it will be in a couple of minutes yeah okay so, sure uh, so I, go ahead yeah so uh okay sorry for interrupting you so uh will we move on uh into uh, continue with uh your uh speech uh yeah your information so uh while we're doing that uh, i would like to also invite uh, another speakers also so we will have like a uh, full discussion with all of the speakers uh, while you're presenting uh, the topic is it okay of course of course so, okay sure okay now for the second speaker i would like to invite miss diwe suhari the founder of alzi good afternoon hello Hello. Good afternoon to you. Good morning, Shaba Roy. Good to be in the same <laughs> screen with you. 
<laughs> Great to meet you. Okay, it's, uh, it will be a very interesting discussion for today. Uh, maybe, uh, Miss Dewes Arya, you can uh, introduce a bit of yourself before we are moving uh, to introduce uh, the last speakers uh, for this uh, session. Yes, um, my name is D.Y. Suharia. I am the founder of Alzheimer's Indonesia and regional director of Alzheimer's Disease International. It's uh, headquartered in London, but I'm based in Jakarta, Indonesia. I'm also uh, the co-leader of Wellbeing Task Force uh, on the V20. Very happy to be here and interested uh, to get to know everybody here as well, perhaps through chat or Q&A later on um on the topic of well-being in securities values uh guide to youth leaders thank you okay thank you miss dewey okay and then last but not least uh please welcome uh for mr samsul abiansha the coordinator of c20 sdgs and also the humanitarian work group good afternoon mr samsul uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Aditya. Uh, hi, uh, Suarya and also Cyberoy. Please introduce. My name is Samsul Ardiansa. I am the coordinator of uh, uh, SDGs and Humanitarian Working Group of the Civil 20. Civil 20 is one also official engagement group of the G20 under the Indonesian Presidency. Uh, so it is uh, good to know you, each other, so we can probably have more discussion letters back to you Ms. Adi. okay thank you mr samsu okay so all the speakers are here and uh mr cyberoy you can continue uh your discussions the presentations and our will be preparing for the presentation also uh i'm sorry mr cyber is still muted after all this time okay. with all this virtual working i can still manage not to come off mute, isn't it? <laughs> Slightly awkward. Yeah, so, yeah. Sometimes it happens. <laughs> it certainly does. Um, I, I do. I do find that to be slightly embarrassing. I do apologise. Uh, so uh, I'd like to uh, make the case uh, that uh, being aware and activated in your personal values is an extremely effective way to align your well-being and your professional development. Uh, I started my career as a medical doctor, uh, culturally, socially, from a family perspective, and in a way dominating my well-being. Everything in my school years was uh, aligned with achieving this goal. And I felt so happy and so relieved uh, when I qualified. And, and everyone was happy. Everyone was delighted. My parents, my extended family, everyone was so proud. And I, and I felt amazing. And I took to it well. I listened to my mother and treated everyone with kindness as if they were my relative. And I received praise for being effective. And I had the skills and attitude to do well, apparently, which was also great for my well-being. Uh, but this story only starts well. And I can pinpoint the very moment that is most pertinent to why I'm speaking to you about personal values, personal leadership and well-being in early career experiences. Before a long holiday weekend, all those years ago, I made extensive thorough preparations for patients under the care of the senior doctor I reported to. I asked questions of how to hand information over and to who to speak to. Surprisingly, despite every junior doctor being in exactly the same situation, there wasn't a specific way of working, but there were plenty of informal rules and I adapted accordingly and I felt good uh, when I left. Um, I went home for three days, enjoyed the intention of proud parents, um, and returned uh, on a Tuesday to a disaster. Uh, the actions and plans that I meticulously set out for vulnerable patients had not been followed, and patients who were well on Friday were sick on Tuesday. In that instant, I felt an overwhelming sense of responsibility, shame, fear, hope, focus, as it occurred to me that if the plan for one patient had not been followed, then what does it mean for the others as well? Now, if I tell you the full story, we'll be here a long time and I will lose my composure. Um, but first things first, the patients recovered, thankfully. But what happened next 
revealed to me what happens when your personal values and leadership characteristics are in conflict with the environment in which you work. My honesty, integrity, decency, determination to prevent this from happening ever again resulted in blame and scapegoating and aggression and humiliation. It seems so obvious now that my personal values were in direct conflict with the expressed values of the environment I wanted to succeed in and my well-being suffered as a result. So fast forward a couple of years, the fire that ignited that day in my spirit resulted in non-traditional career opportunities that led eventually to consulting. I didn't really know anything about consulting, but I was frustrated at the slow pace and absence of urgency for the policy-based work I was doing. And that all linked back to that original moment I just shared with you. Um, anyway, uh, there's one consulting company that famously, or for some infamously, stands out. And when I had to, the opportunity to join them, I took it. At this stage in my life and career, I still wasn't consciously thinking about my personal values, but the company's values were, were next to every lift entrance in the building and on the wall of every partner's office. And I loved them. I loved those values. I was so inspired. And I assumed they were written, printed and framed because they represented something real. And, and how they did for some, and you know, wow, what an extraordinary bunch of people you occasionally saw. Um, I thought I found my professional home and how I really wanted that to be so because of those values that I read and referred to all the time. And I would take teams to stand in front of those values, read them out and challenge us to have a conversation in service to those ideals. Now, I can't pinpoint the exact moment the way I did before when I realized my values were in a conflict state. But I can remember the moment when I shared some deep concerns I had with my line manager about the health of someone in my family. And the response was callous and rude. I can remember the moment when I was blamed for a pitch that resulted in silence and no questions from a board of directors. And I remember the journey from that office back to the airport, fearing the humiliation that was being foreshadowed by the partner's comments. I remember the phone call with that same partner four hours later after landing back in London, telling me that the stunned silence was due to admiration of the vision I presented. It turned out they loved it. Now, I would like the slide to be uh, shown now, if possible. Um, the slide represents my well-being journey in both of these examples. And I have chosen to use something as trivial as emojis to soften the edges of what is ultimately a hard truth. And that is that values misalignment is horrible and it can ruin your personal well-being. Now, the slide uh, is not visible to me. Uh, can I check, Aditya? Can you see the slide or is it still not? Well, it's still it's still not currently. Uh, let's uh, continue, Mr. Sabal. I'll continue then, okay. So I share these two examples to illustrate how it can manifest when there is misalignment of personal values, leadership characteristics, and the actual values of a workplace, not the ones printed and framed on the wall. And one of the values in that organization was an obligation to dissent, but only, I was told, when invited and in dedicated problem solving sessions. So okay. not quite an enduring value. Now, I'm going to shift the emphasis of my discussion. I wanted to share two examples, and I do want to emphasize that this is my personal experience that, op that represents obvious misalignments of my personal values, resulting in big implications for me. But for others, okay. the version of, the, of that company or, or, or that profession is very different. And the experience of those is completely in line with, with those values in those frames that I mentioned. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Saibo. Okay. It's very interesting uh, how uh, the value of uh, your personal value, uh, it, 
what it was challenge what, between the organization and was it it become like insecurities for yourself and you challenge your uh yourself your well-being as a person also well or maybe i would uh ask also the opinion uh from oh i think did, did you forgive me <laughs> um i please forgive the interruption may, may i complete yes. one point only because i, I recognize yeah, that um, sure, sure. uh because i don't i, I, oh, okay. I want to balance the presentation uh, it's not just a, a, a set of uh, tough stories. Um, I okay, do okay. want to sure. uh, emphasize um, that it doesn't have to be like that. And okay. uh, and I do have a couple more uh, minutes of prepared uh, remarks, and I'll, I'll, I'll be as quick as I, as I can. Uh, what I'd like to uh, explain is that um, it doesn't have to be like this. And it seems to me that there's usually an acceptance that values and well-being uh, can, um, can be in conflict in professional life. And I'd like to emphasize that, that it doesn't have to be like that. Um, I'm now a co-founder of an organization that's explicit about its values, living our values. And I've reflected on this a lot with the support of my amazing colleagues. And I'd like to be very practical about, about something that you can do. So we just mentioned insecurities and with, if you are in a situation in your dream job or a prestigious job that doesn't align with your personal values, then your personal insecurities might be triggered. And, and I think this is, a, I, I've reflected something I wish I knew when it was happening. And, and you might question what it is about you that is making this happen. You might look to criticize yourself seek feedback about how you can adapt more to others to help manage any insecurities and avoid risks of those so-called chronic insecurities that were mentioned in the notes i'd like to suggest that you treat the ability to give and receive feedback as the advanced and nuanced skill it is um, because uh, the way that we mostly receive feedback is when someone in a position of authority tells you what you need to do to be more suitable and acceptable to them and they are the gatekeeper to your progression and that doesn't sound quite right does it it doesn't really sound very bilateral so you need to be self-aware and you need to be able to critically analyze what is being said about you not just accept it because it's given by someone senior and that skill of giving and receiving feedback includes the ability to ask for it and give feedback in return in a structured way to make it a habit in your meetings and this is a powerful way to identify risks of misalignment and opportunities for values alignment which will then in turn contribute to your well-being so i'll conclude there um thank you for giving me the chance to explain the balancing point i think if um i can emphasize one key message is that values alignment is so valuable for your well-being and values misalignments can feel horrible. And if there's one specific skill that you can adopt to help yourself with that, it is the ability to give and receive feedback. So again, th thank you for the couple of extra minutes. Okay. I'll conclude that. Okay. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Saibel. Uh, it's a very interesting case. I mean, uh, it, it can be like a reference for all of us uh, in uh, in this term. Okay. Uh, maybe I would like to ask Miss Dewey. Yeah. It's a very interesting case uh, from Mr. Saibal, and I would like uh, to connect more uh, to today's topic. Uh, how do you think, like uh, the, the case from Mr. Saibal, which is how your personal uh, value, uh, which not aligned or have been challenged by the organization, and then the, it's triggered the insecurities, and at some point it will affect your well-being and how do you see this context into the importance of young leaders here uh, to manage uh, their own well-being and personal value? What do you think about it? Thank you, uh, Adit. And uh, Shaibal, it's also great to uh, learn from you. And I completely agree with you on values alignment um, context. So in relation to your question, Adit, um, and also aligning with the theme today. Um, I established Alzheimer's Indonesia uh, back in 2013. It's almost uh, 10 years. 
Um, and it was established uh, because um, there's a purpose <clears throat> in improving quality life of people with dementia and family caregivers in Indonesia. Um, and why it's important? Because uh, I, I was experiencing uh, challenges in life at that moment. My mother was diagnosed with vascular dementia and I was affected. My quality of life was affected because of that situation. Uh, so in connection with the topic today, um, quality life um, is really connected to the context of well-being, a state of awareness, uh, the experience of good health, happiness, prosperity, uh, including having good mental health, high life satisfaction, everything. But when I was taking care of my mom with my dad and my siblings, my schedules, my life um, is affected. And it's very important uh, to understand um, and link up to the values as well. And the values that I have was on values of caring, values of communication, uh, values of commitment, accountability, and all those things. Um, so in relation to the journey of caring, it's also the journey to well-being. Um, and insecurities um, is, is, was experienced as well in my case. Um, I was insecure because um, every time my colleagues or my friends uh, wanted to, to have a meeting, uh, I had to adjust my schedule uh, with my time in taking care of my mom, uh, which made me a bit behind in certain things. And it's affecting financial stability as well. Um, and in order for to have a, a balanced life, there's all these aspects that was discovered, the aspects of education, clarity on understanding what the disease was, what our role is, uh, and that triggered me to establish Alzheimer's Indonesia. Um, and we produced this, um, I don't know if you can see it, but it's a 10 warning signs of dementia Alzheimer um, how knowing these 10 signs, it will build up the whole uh, knowledge and understanding uh, to be aware and to know what your role is and to get diagnosis, treatment and care and all that. So I believe um, the whole values uh, and insecurities, uh, it's, it's really intertwined and it's something that we all experience. In my case, because of my own personal experience, it led me to establish a network of support groups, family caregivers, um, helping them to journey uh, what I've experienced. And my mom passed away in 2017, but her legacy continues. And the whole concept of moving forward is basically um, empowerment and engagement. Uh, which is very important uh, because there's all these issues that's actually connected with loneliness, anxiety, depression. These are the risk factors that are affecting our well-being. I hope that answer um, your question, Adit. Sure, sure. It's really answer my questions, and thank you uh, for sharing your experience, uh, Ms. Liu. Okay, uh, from uh sorry from uh, the case here the case from mr sable and also miss dy i would like now ask uh, mr samsul here uh you must be have been working with a lot of people especially the younger generations uh with your work and how do you think about uh, a condition of a leader how they can state uh like i have a good well-being i have less insecurities and i have a good value uh, in going out with my life. Uh, so uh, in the context of working in the organization that I can be a good leader and lead my subordinates uh, within it. How do you think a leader can create that kind of situations? Uh, thank you, Adit. Uh, I hope my voice is uh, clear enough. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, Probably I will not directly answering your questions, but I would like to share some of the recent research by uh, conducting by the World Bank. Uh, the research is uh, on the asp aspiring middle class. 
uh, recently World Bank released a research uh, that says that uh, right now uh, Indonesia, uh, the population of the aspiring middle class is Indonesia is very, we have a very huge numbers of populations of aspiring middle class. We have around 115 millions or, or, or almost 45% of the total uh, population in, in Indonesia that has become uh, aspiring middle class compared to numbers of uh, the middle class uh, that uh, all, almost uh, 52 millions. What is aspiring middle class? Aspiring middle class is the people that has no longer uh, below the poverty line, but they has no like uh, security in, in, in the context of uh, joining into the middle class. So they, they this is the, the, the element, mostly of this element is coming from the youth. Uh, and this is facilitated by like uh, digital transformation that happening uh, in our countries uh, recently. So uh, uh, job is like uh, uh, job opportunities uh, open uh, very large, but uh, in the same times the uh, security for job security is uh, is uh, become uh, most more vulnerable. We have like digital workers, like uh, youth who ha who is working for the like uh, uh, like for example in the context of Indonesia is like they're working for Gojek. They they the industrial relation become uh, more it's not like uh, the conventional relations, uh, and uh, sometimes they they are now uh, in the middle class behavior, but they basically the position is still still under the poverty. What I'm going to uh, explain, uh, I, I, another thing that I, I think probably I would like to also sharing in this uh, uh, opportunity is I, I was reading the books uh, written by Yuval Noah Harari, uh, 21 lesson from the 21st century. There's a, there's a chapters in that in that books uh, that uh, sayings about the the jobs uh, in the futures. So. Yuval Noah Harari said that uh, probably when you grow up, you have no jobs because the ecosystems, the environments of jobs is become shri uh, shrinking. And the context that I'm going, uh, I'm sharing this issue right now is related to uh, what uh, I'm uh, with the C20 doing in the context of uh, responding to the new ecosystem for the new futures. As you may know that uh, Indonesian governments under the uh, G20 has uh, teams uh, recover together and recover strongest. And in my in my understanding, that the future's uh, environment will be much will be very much different with uh, the, the current situations. The things that are related to this uh, the, the the this this issue. Uh, actually, I have my presentation that if I allow. I can share uh, one slide of my presentation saying that the uh, the recent situation in the context of uh, Indonesia. Uh, sure, Mr. Shamsu. I don't know how to sure. use this stream, but <laughs> I'm going. To, I'm just going to explain that. Uh, yeah. For example, uh, uh, in the context of Indonesia, in 2017, uh, we have uh, Indonesian Youth Development Index. Uh, and in this uh, index, you can say that there is uh, still problem in the context of mis uh, match matching uh, between education and also employment. The, uh, the index of education in Indonesia is very high, but uh, uh, on the employment become very uh, still uh, still below from the from the average uh, I think this 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 connect to what what will be the challenge for the youth right now uh, we are we are facing I think the youth uh, right now we are they, are they are facing the 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 new situation that probably we, they cannot learn from the uh, generation like me uh, the the old generations uh, in our society they have to adapt with the new kind of uh, situation with the new challenges we, we don't for example we don't used to be we don't know about cyber bullying right now we are facing the situation cyber bullying while most of uh, the youth in uh, especially from Indonesia are now uh, already engaged in, in in the context of uh, digitalization and others uh, issues that related so 
this is also i think uh, this is also i think the most important uh, issues uh, especially for the youth in indonesia in in the context of how they can project the futures of indonesia and uh, state their position in the correct ways because uh, i'm not saying that they cannot learn from the from the history they're still learning from history but the challenge in the future will be much different uh, with now this is i think become the most uh, challenge in the context of when we are talking about the well-being of the youth especially for the for the uh, uh, for the future leaders of indonesia and uh, yeah i think i will stop there uh, i hope this answering your question yeah okay thank you mr samsul okay now uh well mr samsul also said about uh the challenge right the challenge uh what challenge was faced uh by the youth right now uh mr say also mentioned about uh how uh we have to prepare the young generation to move into their professional life because there, there there are a lot of things that they have to align and there will be a lot of challenge uh into into what they are going to do in the future and in that context mr saibel also has mentioned uh in the uh earlier that uh there is something that you have to put into habit there is a value that you have to put into habit uh that will be uh helping you in to um into uh facing the challenge ahead now uh maybe i will come back to uh miss dy first uh, what kind of value do you think that is very important right now for the youth leader yeah for the youth and especially the youth leader that they have to embed that value into their habit into their personal life itself uh, what do you think what kind of values that is the most important things right now because currently uh, well all of us the youth facing a lot of challenge with uh, the dynamic uh, change of things that happen, the development of technology and et cetera. What value do you think is very important that they have to have and embed it into their life? And, um, I, and... yeah, because I, um, I'm a big believer in the quality life um, and because uh, my quality life was affected, um, I, I believe the, there's also for youth to, uh, there's a model, Barrett model, um, if they want to go to valuecenter.com, there's all the, all, also all these quizzes to uh, identify uh, the values um, uh, that are connected to them. And Nanilai um, actually also produced a report uh, on, on the uh, survey report um, in, 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 in relation to values as well. But if you're asking me, um, um, I, I think it's related to the values of uh, respect, communication, empathy, uh, engagement. Um, these are the, the values that matters, uh, you know, in, in terms of, in terms of um, really connected to the leadership um, philosophy. Um, you know, as a good leader, through time, through experience, um, majority leaders have gone through suffering pain is 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 actually a very significant process that could affect um how the the person is going through their challenges and only through that whole process of suffering um you, you know people can understand um on how to decide uh what to decide it's affecting well-being completely uh it it, it affects it you know it makes you insecure um, anxiety and all that. So to answer your question, um, I believe because of the whole technology as well, and I see that somebody is asking about how digital transformation can increase the value of human being. I think digital transformation um, is, is also a, a positive uh, context, but it's also the challenge is to use technology and digital transformation to improve well-being. Uh, rather than the way uh, the other way around. So, um, so for 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 in, in terms of values, you know, there's there's all these components and values. There's 
all these um, uh, choices to make um, for 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 a leader or, or somebody who will aim aim to be a leader in the future to understand uh, why those values matter. And I think we can go back to what Chaibal mentioned earlier on the values and uh, values alignment. Uh, how environment sometimes is not supportive on what we believe, um, and these things are actually uh, the journey to well-being. Uh, okay, thank you, Ms. Dewey. Thank you uh, for your answers. Okay, uh, move on. I would like also to ask the same question uh, from Mr. Sable, because you already mentioned about how you have to embed uh, the, the value uh, into your habit, into yourself. And yeah. what do you think, like the most, maybe one, the most important value that you think is very important uh, that maybe you implement and you try to embed it into maybe your coworker in the Axial region or uh, in every organization that uh, maybe you lead into the team. So what do you think? Okay, so thank you for the question. Uh, we, we've um, started our discussion uh, without uh, really defining what some of these terms uh, mean. And um, we, we just heard about a measurement system related to values uh, called the Barrett uh, uh, Value Center model. And so I'd, I'd like to answer your question in three parts. The first is to uh, use the definition that if, if values represent what we care about most, and the question is what kind of values are important to youth leaders, then uh, in the context of how we were just discussing big uh, shifts, industrial shifts like digital transformation and sustainability, environmentalism and so on, then I would say that the types of values that are most important for youth leaders are uh, to do with caring about your vision, caring about being determined to succeed with your goals, caring about focusing yourself and your creativity to make a difference for yourself and uh, the wider community uh, and further values such as inclusion and responsibility. Now, now to me, uh, these are highly specific words and, and not just things to just list because they they, they sound right uh, for, for young leaders. And I appreciate that you asked me to reflect experiences from, from the organization uh, in which I work uh, and help lead. And we, we have three values. Um, transparency, authenticity, and generosity. We, we are authentic, transparent people that really want to give. And when that alignment happens in a group of people and you have differences, but you also have a shared aligned focus, it feels completely different to when you feel like you're leaving part of your heart at home to go to work or you can't fully express yourself. So I'll conclude my answer there. But if if you do want to take the discussion in the direction of how do you measure these things, um, now that we've had a reference point to some of that, I can elaborate on that if you wish. But I'll conclude my remarks for now there. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Saber. Okay. Maybe we'll move on into the things later. Uh, Plus, I would like to ask like the same question also uh, from Mr. Samso because uh, all of the speakers came from uh, different backgrounds, so I think it's very important for the youth to know that uh, the difference uh, of value that uh, every organization have, but it all has the meaning, it all have uh, important things uh, to all of us. Okay, Mr. Samso, what do you think? Yeah. What value is very important? I, I strongly agree with uh, Mr. Saibal said about the uh, transparency, authenticity, and also generosity. Probably I will add uh, some uh, other uh, uh, value that I would like to propose for the young leaders is uh, openness. Why openness? Because, you know, uh, in, the, in the era of uh, the digital era where we are, uh, seems like we have uh, access to all information, basically, Actually, what we are uh, uh, experiencing right now is tsunami information. And because my background is on humanitarian issues, uh, tsunami is only 30% content waters. Uh, the rest of it is uh, trash. So uh, this is tsunami information. We need to, to be very careful in the context of uh, uh, 
uh, also what uh, has been said but by uh, Mrs. Suhari about the, uh, the uh, effect uh, of uh, trans digital transformations. Uh, openness is the principle that we, we are open to any kind of information but also have uh, principles in the context of uh, compiling and also assessing the, the uh, information. And the, the second is criticism. We have to always criticize about what we are uh, receiving right now. Again, I would like to share my... Uh, I, because I just read the book uh, right uh, by Yofal Maharari. He said that uh, in the future, uh, the tyranny is not coming from the military regimes that using military forces to oppress the peoples, but coming from the irrelevances. Uh, uh, that uh, he said he mentioned about dictatorship of big data. Uh, uh, some uh, you know probably we, we already heard about how uh, uh, algorithm has been used by oppressive regime to oppress the peoples and to 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 like uh, to uh, to guide people into the wrong directions. And the third is creativity. Uh, uh, I think this is also value that uh, uh, need to be embedded by the young leaders right now, creativity, because like I said before, the situation that we are facing right now is very much different with what we have have been facing the, in the past. So, so you need to find out what will be uh, what what things uh, different from 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 the from the past, and I think that's uh, I I will add three more uh, values. Uh, first is uh openness uh, the second is uh we have to still always to criticize and uh the third is uh creativity for the as as as, as the principal value that hopefully can be used uh for the uh, uh young leaders right now back to you mr okay okay thank you mr samso of her answer okay now uh I think that uh, we have a few minutes left before the Q&A session. Uh, so uh, because we still have uh, a little time. Uh, Mr. Saibor, I would like that to back to you uh, about the measurement, how we measure uh, uh, this value uh, that you've mentioned before, maybe uh, in short. OK. There are several uh, established uh, methods that people who work in values will be familiar with for, for values measurement systems. One was mentioned before. They uh, usually work um, by asking you to select words that represent what you care for. And then uh, collections of those words are analyzed to then be able to show for groups, what you all have in common and where you have differences. Uh, that's more or less how the, uh, my understanding and interpretation of the Barrett model that was referenced before. Uh, this is, uh, in my personal experience, a very effective way uh, to uh, to start measuring values. And uh, But there is a really important point I'd like to emphasize, and that is um, to have some understanding of why you're measuring it in the first place. So yes, you can use measurement systems for values, for personal characteristics as well. Um, you can use measurement systems for culture, these topics that some people feel are soft um, and intangible. But um, if there's one point uh, that I can emphasize, it is to be clear as to why you're measuring your values or your culture or your well-being. So there is good innovation in the measurement of well-being, which also requires a definition of, well, what do you mean by well-being? And most well-being definitions you can read about have some element of physical health and emotional or mental health. But these are not the, yeah. these aren't the only two dimensions of well-being. There's spiritual health. Uh, there is societal health. There, it's more or less how you are, what's influencing you right now. And so a measurement system for global well-being for example, that exists based on the Barrett model is different to a measurement system for personal well-being. And you might think, well, you can take the personal one and just get lots of people and that represents the global. But 
th there's some logical connection there that needs to be thought through really carefully. So I please, I urge, if you are thinking about measuring these things, ask yourself, why are you measuring these things? And, and if you have the answer of what is your set of personal values, what is your culture, what will you do with it? And in fact, let, let me ask that question back to you, Adit. If you could measure well-being um, for a purpose or your values for a purpose, what would you do with that understanding? Well, uh, if I don't have understanding about it, I would like uh, I will I will ask uh, I will ask an expert or someone that uh, eligible or credible to answer uh, that kind of things because as you mentioned before, if we don't have any understanding about it, uh, it will mislead our thought and also our opinion and our mind about what is the state of well-being itself because it's very dangerous if you have like a misunderstanding about that kind of thing so what will what will i do as a person if i don't know uh the yeah the definition or the meaning itself i would like uh, i will gain more feedback and ask uh, another person that i think more credible to and uh, more know about the, uh, that kind of thing i more knowledgeable about that kind of thing that, that's the kind of things that I will uh, do necessarily. May I offer one very quick remark and response? So for yeah. all of us yeah. participating in this yeah. discussion, yeah. I'd encourage yeah. us all to think, if you did have an accurate measurement of your own values, of your own well-being, what would you do with that information tomorrow? And, and if it revealed to you um, that uh, your personal values uh, included... Um, patience and tolerance and determination and openness i really enjoyed the remarks earlier about the importance of openness then what would enable you to tomorrow or later on today do something different now you know that your personal values include something that you felt before but now you have a measurement for it this is not such a straightforward thing and and actually if um friends who are listening to this if participants listening to this want want to explore that uh, then maybe we can do some of that in the Q&A but then also the link to the V20 is is even in the slide header right so so that there are uh, groups of uh, passionate uh, people working on these very questions so so again I, I'll conclude without an extensive answer but I really want to urge the right question if you did know what would you do okay Okay. Maybe uh, Ms. Dewey, um, uh, Mr. Samsel would like to answer uh, Mr. Saibal questions before we go move on to the Q&A. Maybe Ms. Dewey? Go ahead, Mr. Samsel. I see him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Mr. Samsel, Ms. Dewey asked you maybe, to try to answer Mr. Saibal questions. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Sable, for your uh, for your uh, question. I think uh, it for for me uh, uh, the challenge is that we need to do is uh, how to uh, how to uh, pardon, how to how to share our principles. In, for example, in the context of openness to to uh, to our environment, because the the biggest challenge right now is we are on the edge of distractions. So many distractions. Uh, like uh, we used to be, for example, in our generation, probably we are. Uh, if you want to know something, we 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 are going to uh, going to the library and to uh, seeking information based on like a scientific journal or books and other things. But right now, the, the, the current, the, the, the recent generation are not doing things like that. They, they, they mostly uh, uh, exposed by information that's shared by social media and others. Uh, that actually, uh, social media has to do things that uh, in the opposite. <laughs> they have positive and also uh, negative sides of, of the social media. So uh, uh, my 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 response will be uh, that this principle is because this is my personal principles and also we would like to also I also want that uh, my especially for example my 
my families for example has also similar uh, situation so i will i will uh, showing myself as in bahasa indonesia we call it teladan so we are we are become the the champions in in the context of promoting openness yeah i know that this openness can be fired back to us uh, because some we cannot open everything we can we cannot be openness to everything but actually but basically uh, this uh, this principal value can stand alone it has to be like uh supported by others uh principles like what you said uh, generosity authenticity and also uh transparency uh, as uh, as the comp- uh, complementary uh, values uh, uh for for our personal life so i think probably that's that is my i hope i am answering your question yeah. mr sahibal and i uh, i'm really hoping that uh it, to be honest this issue is very much new for me So I'm still have to like I'm uh, while listening and also uh, preparing for re- uh, responding. I'm listening your uh, presentation and also presented for, uh, for, from Ibu Suharia to get more understandings about the issue of well-being and also insecurities. Because probably I'm experiencing the situation that I'm not aware that I'm in the in, in the context of what we are uh, discussing right now. Back to you, uh, Mr. Adit. Okay. So Saibal, maybe uh, that's uh, one of the answer uh, that could give. Uh, I hope it answering uh, for your questions. Okay, but maybe because uh, it's the time for the Q and A sessions, so uh, I will uh, get back. Maybe maybe there's uh, something in the question that align with uh, uh, that can be aligned with uh, the. Last thing that we discuss. Uh, the first question is uh, from Bangkok, and it's specifically mentioned to Miss Dy. So uh, I don't know if he or she, but uh, back when you are fresh graduate, uh, what is the biggest challenge or uh, the of decision that you must face, and how you deal with it? When I when I was a first graduate, uh, first graduate, yeah. Yeah, I went to University of Indonesia, English literature. Um, I also was a first graduate of Ohio State University, Columbus, Ohio, majoring in journalism. And I also, uh, I experienced the challenge of getting a job, rejections. Um, um, and, you know, uh, my GPA was really good, but getting those rejection letters from MTV, from all these, um, I was I was actually, I went to Ohio State, I graduated um, and uh, my internship was in Washington DC at uh, CNN. Uh, and a friend of mine told me that if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. So I went to New York with only $1,500 uh, on my pocket. And I had a friend, I have a friend who actually helped me. I stayed there. But apparently it's not easy to get a job and it's not easy to deal with rejection. And how did I deal with it? Perseverance, I don't give up. I send CVs, 100 CVs every week uh, and realize that's not the best strategy. The best strategy in New York was to, to connect the dots, to plug in, to understand um, um, you know, my skills uh, and what I can offer. And it took me like a month until I finally get a job uh, and feel secure uh, and identify my strength and weakness. Uh, and it was the best time of my life. I hope that answered your question. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. D.Y. Okay, thank you, T. Uh, I hope I pronounce it uh, correctly from Bangkok of the questions. And then we'll move on uh, to the second question. So. I, uh, it came from Jessica Rhodes yeah, uh, from United Kingdom, uh, and the question is: Sometimes insecurities are needed for ourselves to positioning ourselves correctly. From your perspective, how we manage our insecurities for good output? Okay, it didn't mention uh, specifically who these que- questions uh, sent to, but maybe I would like uh, us, uh, m- uh, Mr. Santo, uh, to answer uh, these questions. So she asking about insecurities are needed 
for ourselves to positioning ourselves correctly. So, from the perspective, how we uh, how do you manage uh, insecurities for a good output? I, yeah, uh, uh, probably with my background is I'm not coming from the rich family, and I'm uh, I'm, I'm uh, coming from the like. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm not saying that I'm coming from the poor family, but I'm my family, my background, my parents is not like. Uh, uh, so, uh, insecurity is like uh, daily uh, situation that we are uh, we, the situation that we are facing uh, daily. We are we are we are still uh, we, we uh, I'm I'm like I'm experiencing the situation that probably. Uh, it's not. Uh, I'm not saying that it's difficult, but also it's not uh, in easy situations. I'm coming from the like uh, from the village, uh, and also uh, when when uh, when coming to uh, the new situation, I always feel insecure in everything, including when when for example going to abroad, uh, Ibu Suharia, when for example I, I was uh, assigned to visit uh, Geneva for one meeting. And it's create it's, it's create very very insecure because you know this is not easy for me to to adapt with the with the uh, different uh, situation. I'm coming from like homogeneous uh, societies, and uh, uh, probably Geneva is uh, much different with Jakarta. But uh, let's say Bangkok, who was not uh, uh, not too far from Jakarta, the similar situation, but still. I'm, I always feel uh, insecure in the context of uh, in, in the context of uh, uh, adapting the new situation. But uh, the the things that uh, I I always do is I'm I have to have peace with myself. I have to understand my limit. I have to understand my weakness. I have to understand my my challenge, and and that's it, that that uh, and and by that I I. I uh, I like I'm 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 set up setting up the uh, response uh, strategies that always evolving. Uh, so so by by the situations. Uh, so the, this is this is the things that probably I'm I'm experiencing my personal experiencing in the context of dealing with with insecurities. And uh, I was taught by my parents that we have. We have always to be grateful in every kind of uh, situation. So this is also my, I think, this is also my coping mechanism in, in the context of uh, personal, personal uh, things. Uh, so uh, again, uh, Mas Adit. So if, if for example, if, uh, insecurity for me is not sometimes; it's every time I, I feel insecure, uh, and every time I feel insecure, I have to. I always make first is I have to make peace with myself. And I always be grateful and start things uh, every day with positive uh, uh, mood. Of, so, so uh, even for example, I'm not having a good uh, situation, but I'm, I'm, I'm. Yeah, in Bahasa Indonesia, especially in for the Japanese traditions, there are uh, like uh, like there are idioms that uh, yeah masih beruntung yeah. So, so it's still. Uh, even we are we're in very bad situation, we have to be still grateful because we are having this situation and we can learn from the situation. I think that's my uh, okay. Why. Okay, thank you, Mr. Samso. Okay, so I think to conclude that uh, um, Ms. Uh, Rhodes from the UK, uh, well, what Mr. Samso said is how we can uh, make a peace with yourself, with ourselves. And then to analyze our weakness, our strength, and then the last one is being grateful for the opportunity that you have, and that is how we can manage the insecurities for the good output. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Samto, for your answer. Okay, and then uh, there's the next question uh, from Gilang Krishnanda from Yogyakarta. So uh, this is about digital transformation. Of course, uh, the the objective to have like a digital transformation is for civilization that uh, produce more effective and a good result. Uh, but do you think that digital transformation can increase 
uh, a value of a human being and if so how uh, maybe mr saiba uh, would you please answer this question from gilan well that is a um that is a question that gives us the opportunity to reflect on the development of the industrial ages and uh, if you are familiar with the idea of the fourth industrial revolution uh, then this might be very familiar very quickly but if we look back through generations over the last couple of hundred years and you look at the big shifts in industrial productivity then each time that's happened whether or not it's due to steam power or electricity or electronics uh, there has been a dramatic uh, change in productivity of the way industries and countries operate and that has changed the way we live so the question is about digital transformation increasing the value of a human being if so how then i'd like to offer uh, a slightly indirect answer i think i personally think digital transformation can massively increase the productivity and convenience with which we live in our activities of daily living and digital transformation especially through advanced analytics in my personal opinion and uh, the um, the internet of things does give us a chance to invent new ways of doing things that we haven't done things before. And the, these could have profound, completely profound uh, impacts on the way that we, we live. But if the question is about increasing the fundamental value of a human being, I would dissociate those two things. And I would say that humanity and the challenges that humans and this is a global population need to face, then, uh, we can look at digital transformation and other industrial shifts as mechanisms to help us achieve what humanity needs to achieve, which at the moment is pretty stark. Themes that will, of course, come up in the months ahead that align with Indonesia's themes for this year's presidency of the G20, global health architecture, digital transformation, uh, energy transition. So I I've chosen to answer indirectly by separating out the benefits of digital transformation from how to value humanity. So do I think digital transformation can increase value of human being? Um, I think digital transformation can dramatically increase the convenience and productivity with which the activities of daily life work. How does that relate to being human? Well, they are tools that we can use to achieve what we need to, which totally align to Indonesia's presence in the G20, prioritize global health architecture, digital transformation themes and also energy transition. So so uh, I'll, I'll conclude my answer to that. I'm keen to know, do you feel like I answered the question a bit or um, yeah. have I dodged it? What do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I think uh, it's answering the questions because <laughs> there is this is the question that could not be answered directly. I think because it has to be related with uh, another things uh, from the context of the questions itself because digital transformation uh, will connect to a lot of things like you said before digital transformation we all of us must be agreed that it will help to increase the productivity but if we are talking about uh, how digital transformation affect us become human or more human I think it's there is a lot of things to be discussed before we can uh, reach to that point and there is a lot of things that uh, we have to align uh, uh, to that point that I, I uh, I really thought that uh, your answer uh, is really answering the question uh, from Gila. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sir. Okay, so actually uh, we have come close to the end of this session. I would like uh, to ask uh, all the speakers here to give uh, like a closing statement and maybe a suggestion for all of the audience, the young, uh, the young generation, the young leaders of the future leaders uh, of Indonesia and uh, anywhere who watch uh, this session. Uh, I would like uh, us uh, first, maybe Miss D.Y. Uh, would you give uh, the closing statement for today's session and the suggestion to all of the youth 
uh, that watching the sessions. Thank you, Adit. So basically, um, everybody experience insecurities. Um, mistakes are inevitable. What matters is what you do afterwards. And uh, when we started uh, earlier, Shaibal mentioned about the values of openness, generosity, authenticity, something that I really believe as well. So I believe it's uh, really important to to uh, allocate time for reflection uh, in understanding what your values are, what matters to you, uh, and applying these values in daily lives. So, you know, I'd like to add other values on integrity, uh, accountability, respect, uh, cooperation, because we can't do things alone. Uh, we, we connect the dots, we build partnerships. Um, and I'd like to really uh, suggest everyone to uh, explore all those uh, all those um, um, measurements, the tools uh, in understanding your well-being uh, state. Because it's you know the whole definition is to be in harmony. Your thoughts, your words, your action is aligned, and um, and how at the end of the day you also contribute. To, to the world in creating impact. So as a leader, I think you know, it's important uh, in the spirit of influence, in the spirit of impact, uh, uh, and, and it's really important to do your homework uh, in understanding what your values are. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Diwe, uh, for the closing statement. Okay, next uh, I would like uh, to ask Mr. Chamsu uh to give us a closing statement on suggestion also for the youth here for today's session yeah uh uh there are there are several things that need to be prepared by uh, our young generation right now uh i'm 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 quoting uh several uh uh information coming from the uh related to this uh i would like to like uh i agree what with uh, mr saiba say about the generosities i think this is this is the the the, the values that uh uh will be more uh, will will having more challenge in the future we are facing the situation the, the youth leaders right now we are facing the situation with very uh, the situation that become more sensitive than before uh, globalization make everything's become like uh, uh, very systemic uh, for example we are learning by COVID-19 that, that COVID-19 is not uh, only uh, uh, impact into the health sector but also almost all this uh, almost all aspect in the societies generosity become the the i think the essential values uh that need to be held by uh the future generation because you know uh, we are we are we, we until now we still only have one planet uh and we are experiencing the difficult situations uh concerning to issues like climate change we are we are we, we are also having like uh still having very much challenge in the context of how to ensure that everyone are not left behind in 2030 uh we are still having very uh, very like like hungers poverty become still issues that need to be uh, handled and it will all lies uh in the hands of the young leaders so i i uh, i'm I am strongly uh, suggest that uh, the young leader right now need to be refresh uh, the idea or the principal theory of the general cities in the context of how they will lead the futures of our humanity. Uh, back to you, Mas Adit. Okay, thank you, Mr. Samso. Okay, and last but not least, Mr. Saywell. Uh, thank you. 
Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna attempt to connect up what the three of us uh, might have been saying. I, I feel very aligned and, and somewhat actually uh, quite moved by the statement we just heard that we're in the hands of young leaders. We are definitely in the hands of young leaders. And when DUI talked about allocating time for reflection and applying values in daily life, um, yes, yes, absolutely. So I'm going to attempt to try and bring this together into something concrete and practical. So um, values misalignment is horrible and values alignment is amazing. It's so obvious uh, to how you feel when your personal values are aligned with what you need, with your well-being, with, with what you're doing in your early professional years. I tried to illustrate from personal stories that when honesty, transparency, decency, clashed against defensiveness, aggression, blame, scapegoating. Uh, this was a, a, a massive personal well-being challenge for, for, for me. And it, it's difficult in early professional years to quickly and accurately recognize those signs that those misalignments are there. And we heard from DY a couple of times about how measuring values, personal values is really important. I want to emphasize one specific point and that is to do with personal self-awareness of your values and your own ability to give and receive feedback the stronger that skill to give and receive feedback the more successful you'll be in detecting risks of those misalignments and those misalignments can be disguised because your own insecurities which is where we started our discussion they get activated when you receive sporadic, unhelpful, negative feedback. So my main message is to be conscious and self-aware about your own values and please learn how to give and receive feedback. And I believe that will help you allocate time for reflection and apply values as, as promoted by DY. And it will help us empower the hands of young leaders who we need to, to make the world change. Um, but my personal plea to you is to urge you not to rush because we are all on different personal journeys. And the way that you discover your personal values and the relationship with your well-being is different. You've heard multiple different stories this morning, uh, this afternoon. Um, so even though you need to develop the skill, you don't need to go sprinting for it. Just be aware of it and let it happen. Um, and uh, thank you again very much for the opportunity to introduce and develop these points. I think it's been a, um, it's been a great discussion. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Saibal, uh, for the closing statement. Uh, thank you also for uh, Ms. D.Y. and also Mr. Samso for the closing statement. I think it's a very powerful closing statement uh, to all of us here. Uh, and it's really a very uh, great discussion. And I'm very thankful uh, to become the moderator of this session because it's very insightful for me myself here. Uh, and maybe uh, because uh, it's time to uh, close uh, this session, uh, I would like to conclude this session uh, with uh, some key points that I get. Uh, from today's discussion and also from the closing statement. Like, uh, the first of all, uh, is about, uh, like Ms. Dewey said, how uh, us to become more self-aware about, aware about yourself, aware about your value. Because uh, Mr. Saibel said, it's, it is a miserable things if we have like a disalignment uh, if, uh, between the, the value uh, that we have in, in other things, but it would be an amazing thing if we have like a line of value with what we are doing. We, we have talked about a value, about openness, about generosity, all of that things very important uh, nowadays, but in the end, it's how we become aware with ourselves and we have to increase the skill of uh, giving and receiving feedback because that is uh, the things that uh, will uh, make success in the future. And the last thing, and all of us agree that uh, currently in our situation in this era, we are in the hand of the young leaders here. So we will expect that in the future, there will be a lot of young leaders that uh, arise from 
all of the audience here are from anywhere because uh, our future is in uh, the hands of the younger generation. So uh, I will conclude with that uh, statement. Okay, last thank you, uh, Mr. Seibel, uh, for uh, attending to this session. Also, thank you, Ms. Liuai, and also Mr. Samsul. Uh, for attending and for this discussion and for the great insight. Uh, thank you to all of the speakers here. And also, uh, I would like uh, to say thank you also to all of the audience uh, for uh, viewing. And also, I hope that you get a lot of insight from today's discussion in the session. Uh, for Mr. Saibal, Mr. Samso, and Ms. DY, uh, you can back uh, to the big stage. And once again, I would like to say thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. For our... Thank you so much. Uh, Hope to see you all you so at some point. Yeah, Bye. Hope to see you all. Bye.